Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us to honor Dr. Charles L. Bennett with the Rumford Prize. As president of the Academy, it is my pleasure to call to order the 2103rd stated meeting of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In addition to our work as an honorary society and independent research center, the American Academy regularly awards 11 prizes for truly remarkable contributions to the sciences, the humanities, public discourse, and the common good. The Rumford Prize is broadly defined as an award honoring remarkable contributions to the field of heat and light. It was first awarded in 1839, making it one of the oldest scientific prizes in the United States. The list of recipients throughout history is an illustration of the ever expanding possibilities of scientific discovery. Early Rumford Prize awardees include inventors whose work in fields such as refracting telescopes and, in the case of Thomas Edison, electric lighting, laid the scientific building blocks for more recent recipients' contributions to atomic spectroscopy and laser technology. And today, achievements in heat and light allow us to gather virtually on Zoom from all corners of the globe to honor Charles Bennett for his career-spanning work in experimental cosmology. Chuck's trailblazing research has elevated and transformed the field of cosmology, offering an unprecedented view of the universe, reminding us of the joys of scientific discovery. Today's program is designed to honor and celebrate Chuck's invaluable contributions and will include remarks from his colleague, Mark Kamienkowski, the conferring of the award from astronaut Catherine Sullivan, and a presentation from Chuck himself. I'm grateful that so many of Chuck's family, friends, colleagues, and fellow Academy members could be here to celebrate his remarkable career. We hope today's event will feel celebratory despite our distance, and we encourage audience participation at multiple points of the program. Please first use the Zoom chat to share your congratulations and well wishes for Chuck throughout. We will preserve this chat as a guest book and pass your messages along after the event. Following the formal remarks, I will moderate a discussion panel. You can use the raise hand function found under the participant tab to indicate if you have a comment or question, and I will call on you to ask it directly. But first, it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Kamienkowski, the William R. Keenan Jr. Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Johns Hopkins University. Mark is a theoretical physicist who specializes in cosmology and particle physics. His focus has been on particle dark matter, the cosmic microwave background, and cosmic acceleration. Mark was elected to this academy in 2013. He will begin our program with remarks about his friend and colleague, Chuck Bennett. Mark? Thank you. So I'm going to be fairly brief and just uh, introduce Chuck. Um, <clears throat> Chuck has been a colleague of mine at Johns Hopkins since I arrived here in 2011, and he arrived here a couple years before me. Chuck was born in New Jersey. He was raised in Maryland. He was an undergraduate at the University of Maryland. And one thing I learned from him is that um, he was a family friend of Vera Rubin and was doing research with Vera Rubin at Carnegie Institution of Washington when he was an undergraduate. Um, and then Bernie Burke from the radio astronomer from MIT was visiting and Vera introduced Chuck to Bernie and said, this guy's pretty smart, you should take him. And so Chuck went, wound up going to graduate school at MIT doing a PhD in radio astronomy with Bernie Burke. And then afterwards he moved to the, um, to uh, the Goddard Space Flight Center, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, and joined the team of the Cosmic Background Explorer, COBE, and in particular, the Differential Microwave Radiometer Project, the DMR project, where he became deputy PI. And um, that project uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize a couple of years back. And um, afterwards, Chuck then became the PI for something called the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, um, a NASA satellite mission that has revolutionized cosmology and is the reason why we are celebrating him today. It was a remarkable achievement um, scientifically, managerially, um, human resources, managing, attracting and identify, identifying, attracting and managing a, a very strong team of scientists and you know, ultimately being responsible for all the scientific results. Um, he's been rewarded many, many prizes for uh, his, uh, his contributions, all very well deserved. Um, and so in the remaining time, I should say that he moved to Johns Hopkins University. At some point, he decided he wanted to be involved 
in the educational enterprise as well as the research enterprise. And so he moved to Johns Hopkins about 16 or 17 years ago. Um, so I'm gonna to explain to you very briefly and hopefully plain English why it is that we are celebrating Chuck today. Um, Chuck is a cosmologist. Cosmology is a study of the origin, the study of the origin and evolution of the universe as a whole. It is not the study of certain objects in the universe. It's not the study of necessarily galaxies or planets. It is the study of the whole thing as one physical system. Now, at the beginning of the 1990s, um, before Kobe, cosmology was a very, very fringe, not very fringe, it was a sort of a fringe area of physics and astronomy. Um, there was not a whole lot known about the universe. Um, we knew that it was expanding, as Edwin Hubble discovered close to a century ago. Um, but the rate of expansion, the velocity with which galaxies were moving away from us was uncertain to about a factor of two. Um, there was some evidence for some form of dark matter, but we didn't know its density to better than a factor of two. Um, the density of ordinary stuff in the universe that we're made out of, atomic matter, was known to know better than a factor of two. Um, and there were three possibilities for the largest scale structure of the universe. It could have been flat, open, or closed, um, a consequence of general relativity. Again, we had no idea what the largest scale structure of the universe. And we also had no idea what it was that formed the seeds that later gave rise to gravitational amplification to the um, astounding array of structures that we see in the universe today, things like galaxies and galaxy clusters. Um, it was an order of magnitude game. It was an estimate game. Um, if you know, I told people I was a cosmologist, if I told my you know, physicist colleagues I was a cosmologist, they sort of sneer and say, oh yeah, if you get it to the factor of two, you're doing pretty well. Um, maybe you should get a real job um, or things, something along those lines. Um, but Chuck changed all of that. Um, and this is the way he did it. So if you look at the night sky, you see a whole bunch of stars, points of light. And if you look with a very bright um, telescope, you might also see galaxies, which are you know, a little bit larger bright of light. But most of the sky is the space in between stars. And that is dark. If, however, your eyes operated not at optical frequencies, but at radio frequencies, this is what the sky would look like. And this is the map that Chuck and his colleagues at the Wilkinson Microwave and Isotropy Probe made. This is a map of the entire sky. Um, it is called a Molloy projection. So just to give you some reference, um, if you were to take a map of the Earth, and put it in a model wide projection, it would look sort of like this. North America over here, Eurasia over here, Antarctica over here. So this map that we're looking at, which was made by the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, is a map of the entire sky as it would look as if your eyes operated at radio frequencies. And if they could see um, intensity variations to roughly one of roughly one part in 10 to the fifth. So that's what these little color contrasts are. It turns out that the temperature or intensity of this cosmic microwave background everywhere in the sky is the same to roughly one part in 100,000. But if you look very, very carefully, which is what the Wilkinson microwave and such probe, probe did, you'll see that there are tiny temperature fluctuations, some regions in the universe where it's a little bit higher, hotter, and some where it is colder. We know that this is the cosmic microwave background, the afterglow of the hot Big Bang. This is literally the cooling embers of the Big Bang that we are seeing here. And when we look at this cosmic microwave background, we're seeing um, all the way back to the time at which the cosmic, um, the hot Big Bang took place. So we're really looking directly at the infant universe with this picture. And this, picture transformed absolutely everything. It doesn't look like a whole lot if you do not, you know, if you're not a cosmologist, if you're not a physicist. Um, but as Chuck will explain, we know how to interpret this map. And it turns out that there's a huge amount of information. And to make a long story short, you know, just a quarter of a century ago, cosmology was an order of magnitude game, but now it is a paragon of precision science. Um, Physicists and astronomers from all areas of physics and astronomy now look to us, to cosmologists, as um, you know, the people who understand statistics and error bars and detailed analyses, as well as anybody else. And from this data, we now know the expansion rate, the densities of dark matter and ordinary matter, to a few percent. 
We know that the geometry of the universe is flat. And we understand now, um, we have detailed information about the primordial seeds um, that later gave rise to the growth of large scale structures like galaxies and galaxy clusters. And moreover, what's perhaps most intriguing is that the um, characteristics of these seeds for primordial structure are in very good agreement with the predictions of an idea called inflation um, that is in some sense an idea for what gave rise to the Big Bang, what put the Big Bang in motion. And inflation, as it turns out, is an idea that was an outgrowth of, um, was an outgrowth of ideas in um, high energy physics. And so in some sense, cosmology has now been merged with the study of elementary particles and fundamental physics. And we now understand this map, as well as cosmology, cosmology in general, as an experimental arena for fundamental physics. So I just wanted to quote, um, close by pointing out that Richard Feynman, who all of us in physics um, revere as much as anybody else, um, apparently said that you know that a, a discovery is truly significant if it impacts areas of science well beyond the subfield in which it originated. And I think that that, that this, um, you know, the cosmic microwave background measurements that Chuck did um, characterized that as much as anything else that we have ever seen yeah. since the development of quantum mechanics. Um, we now know from the cosmic microwave background, um, we have information about the early universe. Um, our description of the late universe um, is founded on discoveries and measurements from the cosmic microwave background. Particle theorists now take this as one of the inputs to all of their theories. It is essential for our understanding of general, um, general relativity and gravity and quantum gravity. String theorists see it as an avenue towards understanding um, string theory. It's an essential component of everything that we do in extragalactic astronomy and cosmology. And we're even talking about it in nuclear and neutrino physics. So it is extraordinarily well-deserved prize. And I'm gonna congratulate Chuck and say it's been a pleasure to be a colleague and moreover a pleasure to work in a field in which um, your work has played such a central role. Thank you, Mark. It's now my pleasure to turn things over to another Academy member, Dr. Catherine Sullivan. Kathy is an oceanographer and astronaut and the first American woman to walk in space. In addition to her work with NASA, Kathy has served as the chief scientist and later top administrator of the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, as well as the aerospace chair of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. Kathy will read the formal citation and present the Rumford Prize to Chuck. Thank you, David. Established in 1839, the American Academy's Rumford Prize recognizes contributions in the fields of heat and light. The prize is named for physicist Benjamin Thompson, Count Rumford, whose challenges to established physical theory were part of the 19th century revolution in thermodynamics. The Rumford Prize recognizes scientific discoveries that have the capability to fundamentally alter our understanding of heat and light and their potential applications. In the words of Count Rumford, the award is for work that, quote, in the opinion of the Academy, tends most to promote the good of mankind, close quote. For remarkable achievements in heat and light, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences hereby recognizes Charles L. Bennett for his cosmos defining work with the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe or WMAP. Early in his career as a member of NASA's cosmic background explorer team that measured the faint electromagnetic traces of an infant universe, Dr. Bennett helped to redefine cosmology as a precision science. As chief designer and principal investigator of WMAP, he peered into the furthest corners of space, studied the oldest heat and light, and recorded the first data that described the age, curvature, composition, and history of the cosmos, validating the theoretical work of Einstein and the early observations of Penzias Wilson and their successors. From a sky map of careful measurements, he extrapolated a standard model of cosmology, describing the proportions of matter and energy in the breadth of space as well as the time that has elapsed since the initial expansion of the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. As a result of his research, 
cosmology is now a central component in the pursuit of the fundamental laws of physics. Son of a physicist and a photographer, boyhood radio enthusiast and budding astronomer, you have listened to the primordial messages of the universe, calculated their meanings, and provided us with a picture of our origins as complex and profound as it is beautiful. Chuck, my heartiest congratulations to you as a cosmologist and a fellow Jerseyite. So thank you uh, for, for the presentation, Kathy. And uh, while Chuck's getting his presentation ready, let me actually thank the Academy's Prize Committee, uh, led by Pauline Yu, who's president emerit at the American Council of Learned Societies. Uh, it's recently recognized some other uh, distinguished uh, people as well. Uh, Henry Louis Gates, Jr. with the Don Randall Award for Humanistic Studies, Geraldine Richmond with the Distinguished Leadership Award, Ruth Lehman and Gertrude Schupach with the Francis Amory Prize for Reproductive Biology. So Chuck, uh, uh, we look forward to your comments. So thank you very much to uh, David Oxtoby, Mark Kamienkowski, Kathy Sullivan, and especially to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences uh, for bestowing this uh, prize. And, uh, and I'm very humbled and honored uh, to receive it. Um, I wanted more personally, I wanted to thank my family, my wife and two sons, uh, my many, many teachers and mentors over the years, I've learned so much from them all. And, um, and some of them are on this call as well. Um, I, I wanna thank my highly esteemed colleagues. I've had the, the great fortune of working with very fine scientists over the years and learning a great deal from them as well. And, um, and this is the picture of the WMAP spacecraft um, that, that has been mentioned, and uh, and I especially want to thank the uh, the WMAP science team. So the names are listed here. Um, uh, I wanted to point out that you know these days uh, a, a science team could have a thousand or more people on it, and uh, you, you should appreciate the fact that this team, this uh, smaller group of people, did an awful lot of work, and uh, so there was uh, everybody made. Yeah, very significant contributions uh, to the success of this mission. It really was a great team effort. Uh, beyond the science team itself, um, the, there are many people re uh, required to build a space mission. Um, there's project managers, system engineers, discipline engineers, uh, technicians, people that operate the satellite, um, schedulers, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and, the mission uh, success depended on all of these people, uh, again, working very hard. And again, this team of people for this satellite was a much smaller group than normally uh, works on a satellite. And that also translated into a heavy workload for, for these folks uh, with great dedication. And I'm, I'm grateful to them for their, uh, for their very hard work on, on WMAP. Uh, so as uh, has been mentioned, um, Cosmology asks the big questions. How did the universe begin? Uh, how did the universe evolve? What is the universe made of? What shape is it? And what will happen to it in the future? And so uh, these are the questions that we want to address. Um, and it may seem um, uh, like it shouldn't be possible for us to answer these questions uh, because uh, because we're just a you know a speck you know, a speck of dust in the in the vastness of the universe, how could it possibly be that we could know the large scale properties of the universe? And the answer to this is that we have a time machine. Uh, yeah, the most frequently asked question I get is, how could you possibly know all this stuff? And uh, the answer is because we see it. Um, we directly observe the past, and as this movie cover says, it's an action-packed, mind-blowing time travel adventure, and that's what I'm going to go through uh, during my presentation. Uh, so the reason that there's a time machine is it takes light time to travel. Light seems like it travels instantly, uh, but not really. It travels uh, very quickly. Uh, you know, one foot is a, is a nanosecond. That's how long it takes light to go that far, and that seems very fast. Um, but that uh, translates to 186,000 miles per second. I think that's faster than I've ever driven my car. And, uh, and, um, and so, uh, it, again, it's very fast, but it's not infinitely fast. 
And so as we look out in distance, we are necessarily looking back in time. And we don't have a choice about that. That's the way nature works. Uh, so uh, so we, are, we directly observe the past. To give you some examples, uh, it takes light 0 0.04 seconds to go across uh, the diameter of the Earth. It takes light eight minutes to go from the sun to the Earth. So in other words, uh, when we look at the sun, we're not seeing the sun as it is that instant. We're seeing the sun as it was eight minutes earlier. It takes five and a half hours when light to get from the sun to Pluto. The next nearest star beyond our sun is Proxima Centauri, and it takes four years for the light to get to us from there. We live in a Milky Way galaxy. It's a swirling collection of stars and gas and dust. And it takes like 100,000 years to go across the Milky Way galaxy. And so you might think, well, that's an enormous distance. And it is, but it's tiny compared to the universe. And so as we look out further, we have this beautiful picture from the Hubble Space Telescope, the so-called Hubble Deep Field. And it takes like millions of years typically to get between these galaxies. So to answer our cosmological questions, we use the cosmic microwave background as a tool. This is a light of afterglow from the, the hot and dense uh, early universe. And it's been traveling across the universe to us for 13.8 billion years. And so what we see in, the, in this afterglow radiation today is a direct, uh, a, a direct vision of what was in the universe um, at the beginning of its history. So this is uh, you know, the invaluable time machine. Uh, another tool uh, that uh, makes this possible is that uh, so far as we can tell, the laws of physics that we measure here on Earth in our laboratories apply everywhere in the universe. We've never seen an example where that is not true. Sometimes there are conditions in the universe that we can't recreate in the laboratory, which is a, a different thing. Then the universe becomes our laboratory. Uh, finally, there's something we call it the cosmological principle that pretty much every spot in space is the same as every other spot. There's no special place in the universe so long as you consider sufficiently large scales. Obviously, our Earth is different than the spot next to us without an Earth there, uh, but, uh, but you have to go to much larger scales than that uh, to see uh, that, uh, that, that every, every region of the universe the universe is like every other region of the universe, and this is important. Uh, so if you go on the internet, start at the beginning and ask what happened at the beginning of the universe, what is the Big Bang, you will see these pictures. I just pulled these off the internet. You can see they actually have a lot in common with each other. Um, they seem to be showing uh, an explosion somewhere in space um, and that goes off in... Uh, sometimes with rocks and things being thrown out. And you can see that these explosions are uh, pretty uneven too. And uh, this leads to a lot of misunderstandings. You know, people ask me what constellation the Big Bang happened in because these pictures show something like that. Um, so, uh, so this is uh, not, not really what we mean by the Big Bang theory. In fact, I would say that uh, all of these things are complete nonsense. Um, so let me just say a word about what the Big Bang Theory is. The Big Bang Theory is the idea that the universe be, was a, a hot and dense in the past, and over the course of billions of years, the universe has been expanding and cooling. The, the idea of, that supports this, or the measurements that support this, are the expansion of the universe, the fact that the universe is expanding, um, that's actually what gave rise to the idea of this explosion from critics of the theory that said, if you play the expansion backwards, eventually everything's on top of each other. What happened then? It must have been a big explosion. Uh, but uh, it's true that the universe is expanding. It's not true that you can extrapolate back like that. Um, the, uh, the other observations that are important here uh, is that as you go back uh, to the earlier universe, it's very hot and very dense. And at some point it becomes a nuclear fusion reactor and it makes chemical elements. And, uh, and so uh, th those are seen today. And, um, and finally, uh, this, this cosmic microwave background itself uh, and its properties measured by the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite in particular uh, are, um, are consistent and support the idea that the universe has been expanding and cooling. 
So you might ask if these aren't good pictures of what the Big Bang uh, looks like, what does this hot, dense early universe look like? Um, you know, well, I've, I've used my prodigious graphic art skills to, uh, to, to per present the picture that shows a hot, dense early universe that's really, uh, you know, really glowing and unlike these pictures, extremely uniform from spot to spot. And here it is. So um, now you might wonder why you don't see this picture everywhere. Um, I think I might be able to guess, uh, but uh, you know, again, you might think of the early universe as glowing very uniformly, uh, just like this slide. And so the idea of the expanding universe is that if you have galaxies in the universe and you wait, uh, you see other galaxies moving away, moving apart from each other. So we see galaxies moving away from us, but it's not because we're at a special place. All observers on all galaxies would see galaxies moving away. Space itself is stretching, leaving larger and larger distances between these objects. This is what Edwin Hubble found in 1929. So how did the universe begin if it wasn't a big bang? Uh, the, the frank answer is we don't know, uh, but we have an idea called inflation. Um, and uh, the idea called inflation is, is just an idea. I, I note Mark Kamikowski used the same word idea in his introduction. Within this idea, there are lots of very specific theories, but it's more of an umbrella idea. And, uh, and it seems astounding. Basically, the idea is if you go back far enough in time to hot enough temperatures and small enough distances, you must take into account quantum mechanics. And in the quantum world, there are fluctuations all the time. And the inflation idea is that a quantum fluctuation much smaller than the size of a proton, a subatomic fluctuation, inflates to a macroscopic size in a tiny fraction of a second. I mean in a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second. Uh, so this thing is uh, totally remarkable, but this allows you uh, using quantum physics to generate a, a universe out of nothing. It is the ultimate free lunch. Uh, by the way, while this expansion is incur occurring, uh, you pick up additional quantum fluctuations. So uh, the consequence of this is you generate fluctuations on all different scale sizes. And, uh, and the picture on the right, uh, the hills and the valleys are meant to convey that these quantum fluctuations get converted into what we call classical fluctuations, changes in gravity or density of matter from spot to spot in the universe. And so this is our best idea of inflation uh, for the beginning of the universe. Uh, we don't know for a fact that it's a correct theory or idea. And we certainly don't know uh, for which specific theory uh, under the inflation umbrella would be the right one. Although we've ruled out many, there are many left. So, um, so where do we go from here? Well, in cosmology, we can't experiment. You know, almost every other area of science, you do experiments. These usually involve perturbing some system, poking at something and seeing how it responds, whether it's an animal or a chemical or something like that. And we can't experiment with the universe. Yes, there are many people that are expressed to me their gratitude that I can't experiment with the universe, uh, but, uh, but we can only observe. And so what do we do? We map the cosmic microwave background over the full sky. And then we analyze the statistics of the fluctuations we observe in that map. And then we ask the question, what were the cosmological ingredients that led to a the fluctuation statistics like those. Uh, now this is not easy to do because the fluctuations are extremely faint. Uh, we need to avoid disturbances and interference uh, from the Earth's environment. And, um, and so we decided that we needed to make a space mission and take it away from Earth. So uh, here uh, on June 30th, 2001 at 3.46 uh, p.m., the WMAP mission launched uh, from a Delta rocket from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Um, this rocket took the mission on what we call phasing loop orbits around the moon. Uh, so we could steal a little of the moon's gravity and use it as fuel to get the spacecraft out to an orbit around the second Lagrange point L2. Uh, this has been a lot in the news recently if you've been following the James Webb Space Telescope because it is now also 
in an orbit around L2. Uh, they had uh, more fuel capacity than we did, so they didn't need to use anything from the moon and they could go directly. Nonetheless, uh, the reason L2 is a valuable observing uh, position that uh, WMAP you know, pioneered and, and other observatories have gone there is because you can see that the, the sun, the earth and the moon are all behind the satellite. The satellite has this big shield protecting uh, the instruments from the, from, those, uh, from the microwave radiation from those objects, which is a billion times stronger than what we're trying to measure. So protecting ourselves against it is essential. There's also solar panels there for power. There's a communication antenna all pointed back that direction where the instruments and the telescopes here, the reflectors you see, look out into deep cold space. So that's the idea of the orbit and, and, the, and, the, and the satellite design. The, uh, the satellite spins and it precesses and it orbits around the sun. And all of that it allows uh, us to sweep out all the spots in the sky, measure all the spots and uh, make the map out of a full sky. And we carry five instruments aboard that measure at five different frequencies. And what you're seeing here is just cycling the maps we get from those five frequencies. Um, so the, again, this is a projection of the full sky. Every spot on the sky is somewhere right here. And uh, the most obvious thing you see here is this red stripe across the center. And that's because we live in the Milky Way galaxy and the red stripe are microwaves from our own Milky Way galaxy. Um, they're fascinating, but they're in the way of what we're trying to measure. And so what we have to do is either model that emission or uh, where it's too strong, just cut out those parts of the map and not use them. Um, so, uh, so when we uh, when we allow and model for the uh, for this microwave emission and take it away, this is the map we end up with. And so, again, to emphasize, this is map of light that has been traveling across the universe for 13.8 billion years. We are seeing directly what the universe was like 13.8 billion years ago. And what we need to do here is analyze the statistics of these fluctuations in the map and ask, how did this map come to be? So the results of the ingredients is uh, the age of the universe, 13.77 uh, billion years, uh, quite accurately measured. Um, and then we also have the contents of the universe. Um, we have uh, strange contents to our universe. Uh, there are three uh, atoms, cold dark matter and dark energy. And I'm just gonna give you a few minutes of explanation of each one of these. Uh, let me begin with the cold dark matter. It makes up 25% of the universe. Um, and, uh, and it is a particle or particles that we have not identified that, uh, that don't interact with light. That means they don't give off light. That's why we call it dark. And uh, it doesn't block light, it doesn't scatter light. And once again, with my graphic skills, I've provided with you, you with a picture on the bottom left here of the cold dark matter. It is dark, we don't see it. And now it sounds strange to have a particle that doesn't give off any light or, or absorb light, but we actually have candidates for what this might be. Axions, axion-like particles, neutralino and other candidates. Uh, and, uh, and people have been searching for some time, uh, trying to identify which particle or particles make up this cold dark matter. There's lots of searches underway. Um, I'm hopeful that we will, uh, we will determine what this is. From a cosmological point of view, the most important thing is that we understand how it acts. And, and uh, how it acts is that it gravitates, but it doesn't interact with light. So let me move on now to the dark energy, 70% of the universe. Um, once again, I provide a useful picture to you that dark means you don't see anything there. Uh, we don't see it with uh, light. Um, but dark energy may be the biggest problem in all of physics, whatever it is, we don't understand it. Um, but I, one of the questions I asked early on is what is the ultimate fate of the universe? And so the answer to that question depends on knowing what this dark energy is. Um, Albert Einstein introduced his theory of gravity, general relativity, and very quickly turned to applying it to the universe. And he was uh, surprised and disappointed, I think, that it didn't make a universe that was stable. 
Um, and as far as he knew at the time, the universe was stable. And so he introduced a fudge factor into his equations called the cosmological constant. It, it acted as an anti-gravity. And he set its value exactly equal to the gravity value of matter in the universe, and therefore uh, attempted to make the universe stable. Um, once Hubble discovered the universe isn't stable, that it's expanding, uh, Einstein realized that this was a mistake. Uh, however, uh, maybe realizing it was a mistake was a mistake because, uh, because it appears that the universe does indeed have something like this. So a cosmological constant, an anti-gravity, is an example of, uh, of a dark energy candidate. And, uh, and we do observe an accelerated expansion of the universe today that is being driven by this dark energy. But we don't understand at all why the dark energy has the value that it has. It's a very uh, odd value. It's not at all what we would predict. In fact, the value we predict would be enormously larger and, and physicists have known for a long time that the value that we predict uh, that the, it, it can't be, it's just not possible. And so uh, the assumption has been that there's been some way to make it exactly zero, to cancel it. Instead, this has us canceling it to say um, 100 and, uh, 121 orders of magnitude instead of the 122 orders of magnitude we need. And that's just weird. So um, that's, of course, if the cosmological constant or that is uh, the fluctuations of vacuum, a property of space. Um, another possibility is that it's an environmental variable. If inflation created our universe, maybe it created other universes. And maybe this value just gets thrown in randomly in different universes in different ways. We couldn't view all of those universes because they wouldn't live long enough to or, or uh, have the right properties to generate uh, planets and life. So we have an observer's bias in what universe that we live in. And, uh, and this is basically an anthropic argument. And I and many physicists I know hate this argument. Uh, however, we grudgingly admit that it actually might be true. Uh, but uh, but uh, sort of believing this is equivalent to giving up. So we're gonna try harder to see if there's some other explanation. Without going into details, uh, the cosmological constant by the name is constant, whereas the other possibility is that there could be a field that fills the universe that's changing with time. And, uh, and there are lots of measurements going on to try to, to try to pin that down. Finally, Einstein could have been right to start with. There could be a flaw in his theory of gravity that's showing up appearing as this dark energy. And maybe we need a modified gravity model. So, uh, so this, is a, this is a current unknown uh, and a big mystery and, uh, and a prime topic for further work. So as Yogi Berra says, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. So, well, we can't predict the fate of the universe without knowing what this dark energy is. So I'm, I've left the atoms to last, 5% of the universe. Atoms is something we really know about because we're made of atoms. The, our houses are made of atoms, cars, everything we come into contact with is made of atoms. So we feel what we understand those. Uh, in the cosmology business, we call them baryons. And I mentioned earlier that uh, early in the history of the universe, when it was hot and dense, there were nuclear fusion reactions that made atoms um, in the first three minutes of the universe. And, um, and uh, atoms are made now in nuclear fusion in stars. If we use the results of the earlier COBE satellite mission, then, uh, then we get the density of light of photons in the universe. Um, it's 411 per cubic centimeter, or a cube of sugar has 1,500 photons. Um, if we use the WMAP data, we know the baryon density, the atom density in the universe. And if we take the ratio, we learn that there's a billion photons for every baryon. And uh, this turns out to be the only free parameter in the early universe creation of uh, light chemical elements. So before WMAP, uh, when we didn't know this number very well, we would observe primordial clouds, measure the light chemical elements and deduce what this number was. But since uh, WMAP, when we have a, a, a very good value for this number, we go the other way around and use the cosmic microwave background to predict what the uh, abundance ratios are of helium-4, deuterium, lithium-7. Um, 
it turns out that this agrees very well. Helium-4 and deuterium agree very well uh, between the primordial clouds and what we measure in the early universe. But for some reason, the lithium-7 is a little bit off. And uh, it's always been a curiosity of mine why that is. Uh, everything I've ever read in any paper says this will be explained soon. The trouble is I've been reading such a thing for years <laughs> and people keep closing off uh, avenues of explanation. And so it's still a curiosity to me. Um, the shape of space. Uh, the, there are basically three possible shapes of space. The bottom one uh, is the one that you're most familiar with in, uh, in high school geometry. You, geometry, you draw a triangle on a piece of paper, you measure the interior angles and they add up to 180 degrees. Uh, but if you have a triangle that you draw on a horse saddle, the angles add up to less than 180 degrees. And if you draw a triangle on a ball, uh, they'll add up to more than 180 degrees. So you draw a triangle in space and it's gotta be either more than, less than, or equal to 180 degrees. There is no other possibility. And so uh, what we do with the cosmic microwave background is essentially have a big triangle in space and we, we try to assess what the curvature of space is. So we're observing across the universe to this cosmic microwave background, but the light travel, traveling across the universe is subject to the curvature of space. And so uh, that allows us to determine um, which geometry the universe has. And it turns out the, uh, the one we're familiar with, the flat Euclidean geometry, is the one that matches the observations. And this measurement is made to better than 0.5%. So this is a pretty high quality determination that we live in a universe with Euclidean or so-called flat geometry. So um, this, why is this important? Well, because the inflation picture that I pointed out early actually predicts this. It predicts that because of the enormous expansion of the universe, whatever curvature existed before, it would uh, grow to such an extent that it would appear flat or Euclidean to us. And so we can put a check mark next to that prediction. Again, inflation has lots of particular uh, theories, but I'm talking about generic predictions of inflation uh, across, the, across the versions. Another thing that we know about inflation is that if it happened, eventually it slowed down and stopped. The universe is not still inflating from the early times. Uh, while normally inflation would give you equal fluctuation power on every size scale, in fact, um, in fact, it had to slow and stop, and that predicts a slight unevenness, a little more fluctu fluctuation on large scales than small scales, and WMAP detected this for the first time. So this is another check mark for inflation. I'm not gonna go through the more technical things, but there are a couple more bullet items I have here of other generic predictions of inflation, uh, such as an equal number of hot and cold spots in the map, that are, that are predicted. And so, so far, inflation is making successful predictions. Again, it doesn't mean it's true. Uh, it just means that it's looking good. Uh, and so uh, because of inflation and these results, uh, when we had a press release, um, one of my uh, statements made the New York Times quote of the day, it appears that the infant universe had the kind of growth spurt that would alarm any mom or dad. So, um, it helps to have kids when you're uh, working on these things. So let me try to summarize what, I, what I've been talking about. Um, this is actually a, a much better graphic arts piece than the ones I showed you previously. So you can tell instantly that I, I didn't uh, do this by myself. Um, I had a graphic artist, Rick Griswold, who sat next to me uh, with the help of Gary Hinshaw and made this graphic, which has become ubiquitously popular. Um, the idea, as I've described, is the universe starts with quantum fluctuations that, in, at, that inflate to a macroscopic size. And then we have that pattern of light we've been uh, talking about and studying that's put in place when the universe is 375,000 years old. The period after that I call the dark ages because no stars have yet formed to give off light. There's no starlight yet. It's not quite the dark ages because there's still the cosmic microwave background or at that time, a higher energy radiation. Uh, but the first stars don't form uh, till some number of 100 million years later. And then what the diagram shows is this big bang expansion of the universe over, over 13.77 billion years, uh, where, where the universe is expanding, gravity's doing its thing, it's generating galaxies and planets and uh, the structures that we see on the sky 
with uh, the space telescope. Um, and then, uh, and then there's the surprising thing that towards the end we see this kind of accelerating expansion. Instead of seeing the expansion slowing down, which we might expect, it's actually speeding up, and that that is because of this dark energy component. So the question is, you know. Is that going to keep going or is that going to reverse and collapse? And right now we don't know the answer to that. So uh, this picture I hope summarizes, uh, you know, how, at least how I think about the history of the universe and just goes to show that you can observe a lot by just watching. Um, now, not everything is wonderful here. Um, so we can, we, with WMAP, we measure a complete model of cosmology. We can predict what's going on in the universe at any time. And so we can predict what the expansion rate of the universe should be today. And that's the early universe number I'm showing you here, 68.34. Um, but we can also measure what the expansion of the universe is today, the Hubble constant, and that's the late universe measurement, 72.61. And these are pretty close to each other, but not really close enough. I made a little number line at the bottom to show you uh, a star for each of these values, and each of those brackets is a 95% chance that the measurement's consistent with that range. And as you can see, they're close, but they don't overlap, and that's not really a good thing. So there's, uh, you know, some people, many of my colleagues think, colleagues think there's a mistake that's been made somewhere here, uh, but I have to say that if it's a mistake, it's, it's far from obvious. Data sets have been changed out, analysis has been done by independent people, and uh, I think it's uh, not unlikely that what we're seeing is some, uh, some deviation from the model that may be a new piece of cosmology or a new piece of knowledge. We certainly should not discount that possibility. And so I find this to be uh, extremely important and exciting. So uh, unanswered questions. I always like to think about, you know, what, what is it that we didn't learn? Uh, what is the dark energy? What is the cold dark matter? Did inflation happen? And if so, which kind? And this is a bit of a tall order because ideally we would have a quantum theory of gravity. We don't have one. Um, that, you know, if you want to discuss gravity and quantum theory, that would be really useful. Uh, why is there this uh, expansion rate inconsistency I just showed you? Why is that photon to baryon density ratio so huge? Um, that's another little puzzle. And, uh, and the puzzle I mentioned before, why is there this little gap in the abundance of lithium-7 when the deuterium and the helium work out so well? So here's a bunch of questions that, uh, that are things that I still think about and things that I keep wondering about and have ideas about. And, uh, and not just me, but many, many colleagues. And so uh, I want to finish with this, uh, this thought of Einstein's that I resonate with uh, very, very closely. We've learned a lot about the universe and the most comprehensible, incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. We still have more to learn and, uh, and we're, gonna, we're gonna keep working at it. And with that, um, I, will, I will end and uh, thank everybody again. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you so much. This is really fascinating and congratulations again on your award. So now we have time to take some questions and comments from the audience. Uh, so please use the raise hand function in Zoom to indicate if you have a question and I will call on you. Uh, let me start with the first question, uh, Chuck. Um, in 1996, the Rumford Prize was awarded to John Mather for his contributions to understanding the cosmic microwave background. Um, are there connections between his work and yours? Yes, thanks for that question. That's a, a very good question. Uh, the uh, the Cosmic Background Explorer Kobe was an extremely important uh, space mission. It, uh, it had uh, different experiments that uh, did uh, uh, breakthrough science. The, uh, the so-called fire ass experiment on Kobe measured the, uh, the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background, determined it was a black body that really cemented the Big Bang Theory. That was the end of the competing theories. Um, and it also, uh, as, I, as I used in my talk today, gave us the photon density of the universe. Uh, people now treat that like it's a constant of nature, but it's a measured quantity from Kobe. Um, the other thing uh, Kobe discovered was those temperature fluctuations I showed in the WMAP map. It, they, were, they were searched for for many, many years, 27 years actually, uh, for a series of experiments until Kobe finally detected them and got the amplitude of what the level of the fluctuations were. 
And that was a direct motivating factor for our WMAP proposal. Now that we knew that they were there and that we, and we knew how bright they were, we could design a mission to go study the fluctuations. And, um, and it was just clear that that was what needed to happen next. So, so um, Kobe was uh, very much the mother of WMAP. Good. Oh, thanks. That's very helpful. Um, Reiner Weiss, uh, uh, would you like to unmute? Uh, I think you had a, a question or comment to make. Well, I have a comment. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. That's In right. fact, you asked the question that led to my comment. Okay. Good. Okay. <laughs> Ch Chuck, as I know him, has been around. Maybe he was actually, I think it was your first job, Chuck, wasn't it, that you were on Kobe? Yes, you, you brought me down. You, the well, the hell with that. It's just that <laughs> you did something spectacular. And I think we ought to, this, as, since we're celebrating you, I want to make sure people know this. Uh, yes, Kobe won the Nobel Prize for these two things. One was the actual measurement of the black body spectrum that was 2.7 KL Kelvin. But the other, as just you just said, it was the first to see the bubbles or the points or the structure at a very tiny scale, a part 100,000 scale of an intrinsic anisotropy in the cosmic background. That was very, very important. A lot of people had seen other things before that. They'd seen that the sky was hot in one corner and cold in another. And then Kobe saw it even better because of the motion of the earth around the sun. But this was really quite exceptional and had been predicted, but had never been measured. And if you hadn't been part of that experiment, it would never have been measured. <laughs> and I want to explain that. Chuck, as a young man, came in. He was an established group of older guys. And uh, it, it was a mission that had lasted a very long time. And I won't go into that. It took a lot longer to get Kobe going than it took WMAP going, thank God. Uh, and uh, what happened was that Chuck realized very early in this that the sensitivity of the device that was going to measure that anisotropy was not good enough to make the measurement. And that was a profound observation. It's people had suspected this, but Chuck wasn't gonna sit down and let it happen. What he did is he made one hell of a ruckus about this and he made it so that that instrument was improved. And it was improved by factors of, I won't go into the numbers, but if, it ha if he hadn't made the plus, it would not have measured that part in 100,000. So I hold Chuck responsible for the very first measurements of that structure, which later was measured by WMAP so exquisitely. And I thank him enormously for having been a, even he was a deputy uh, chair, a de chair, I guess, co-chair of what's called the DMR, the Differential Microwave Radiometer Experiment. And uh, I think that he made, he helped make that Nobel Prize. Thank you, Chuck. Thanks very much, Ray, for your fine words. Hmm. Right. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from uh, Richard Schifrin. Yes, let me uh, thank you for a terrific talk. I say that as someone in a field of science, light years distant from cosmology. But I had a question from the beginning of your talk. Um, if quantum fluctuations and expansion started the universe, were the laws of the universe, the physical laws of the universe, a random quantum choice? Okay, thanks for that question. That's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, I think that question has been asked in one form or another uh, for, for many, many years, decades, uh, even beyond quantum physics, just with classical physics. Um, I, I, I could be wrong, but I believe Einstein once, once said, he wondered if there was any choice about how to make the laws of physics of the universe. And so, um, yeah, the, I, I certainly don't know the answer to your question, and I don't really think anybody does, but it's an interesting question. We don't understand all of physics now. You know, we have, we have two great theories of 20th century physics. We have, um, we have quantum mechanics and we have the gravity from Einstein, and they don't work together. There's, there's something wrong. We need to figure it out. And it could be that once we figure that out, that we can look back and say, oh, you know, it really all had to be this way. But right now, we just don't know. But I, I appreciate the, you posing that interesting question. Thank you. Uh, a question from Thomas Klein. Uh, yeah, very interesting talk. Um, I hope you haven't answered this. I missed the very first of your talk, unfortunately. 
Um, but somebody told me just recently, I had always figured space is expanding, so therefore we're expanding, but, but very little, obviously. But then the guy told me that no, that the electromotive force somehow keeps space from expanding in our local environment. So the earth isn't expanding along with space and we're not expanding. It, it, A, is that true? <laughs> and if so, why would the expansion of space be affected by some other force? Okay, uh, thanks for the question. Um, some of us are expanding during COVID by eating too much, but uh, that's, a, that's an entirely different topic. The, uh, the, uh, not everything in the universe is expanding. The uh, bound objects don't expand. So for example, we are bound with chemical bonds and we are not expanding with the, uh, with the expansion of the universe. Um, we, um, you know, the, the, the earth and its orbit around the sun is not expanding. You have to get to a scale uh, where objects are not bound to one another by any any force, by whether it's uh, you know anything from gluons in the nucleus to electromagnetic force or anything or gravitational force. You have to get the bigger scales for unbound objects to observe uh, an accelerated expansion. Isn't there always some, some force for every mass of the universe? Small, but everything affects everything else to some extent, doesn't it? Um, if you're referring to the uh, expansion as a force, I'm not sure. Is that, is no, that no, I'm just saying, you, you say you have to have no forces operating on you in order to expand. But no, I'm saying you, there you, any you, place... can't, I, you can't be bound to something. You can't, uh, you can't uh, be connected to something through one of these forces. There's but no doesn't force. gravity connect? I guess doesn't gravity connect everything? I, guess no, no, I mean, you can have unbound objects. Um, you know, like we, when we launch things and throw them off into space and they go flying away, they're not bound anymore. They're not. Ah. And satellite in orbit around Earth is bound to the Earth. Something okay. we throw out and it just keeps going until yeah. maybe something catches huh. it. It's unbound. And is there some understandable for the non-physicist explanation for why that would be the case? Yeah. That bound objects don't expand? Chuck, can I try? Oh. Sure. <laughs> it's, no, it, it's, uh, it's really simple. All these forces that, you, that Chuck was talking about have a power dependence on how, far, how well they work at distances. In other words, the gravitational force gets weaker as one over the square of the distance. Mm -hmm. So all to make gravity go away is you have to get far away from the mass. Or if you want to make electricity and the magnetism be small, you have to get far away from the charges. So mm -hmm. if you get far away, if the, the force goes to zero because of the mathematics of the way the force changes. Oh, so it does go to zero. Yes. Yeah, so, well, yeah, very small numbers. I'm yeah. sorry. I mean, I couldn't help but interfere. I had to. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Uh, a question from Sylvain Capel. Hi. So I'm a topologist. So naturally, I wonder about the topology, the implications for the topology, uh, uh, the qualitative geometry of space as a whole. So does the physical model, does the model that you were describing before involving inflationary expansion and so on, as in the graphic you presented, does that tell us something about the topology of the whole, say of the whole cosmos taken as a whole, as thought of as either a three-dimensional or four-dimensional manifold? Does it dictate that the geometry in the large is Euclidean in that sense? Not in the sense of the curvature, but in the sense of the overall shape, technically the homology, for example. Right, okay. Um, so I think I understand the question. The, um, the curvature that we see on Earth, um, you know, Earth, Earth has definitely got a curved surface to it. And, uh, and, but to us locally, it looks flat because the, curve, the, the radius of curvature is so large. And the whole idea of inflation is that you're driving that radius of curvature to such an enormous value that, uh, that locally uh, it looks flat. Now I'm using the word locally. Um, we, we, have a, we have a concept uh, of, of the observable universe. That's, that's the part within our horizon. The, old, the part, in other words, where light has had time to come to us. So we, when we observe the universe, we don't observe the whole universe. We only observe out to a certain, a certain distance and beyond that light hasn't had time to get to us. Um, so, uh, so we measure and quantify, as I mentioned, the, the, you know, the, the Euclidean geometry within uh, half a percent. That's within our horizon. 
Now, the more, I think you're asking, the more global topology could be more complicated. Uh, it could, uh, you know, really, we don't know what goes on beyond the horizon because we can't observe it. Uh, so um, we, we can put limits on how much it curves out to that part. And, uh, and it could be that there's some curvature uh, if you go several orders of magnitude uh, more in putting limits on it. Uh, and then you would know something more about the global topology, but we observationally, that's just not possible for us. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's a student question, Brandon Keck. I'm an undergraduate student studying astrophysics and I'm really interested in cosmology. Um, I didn't have a question. I just wanted to say it was really inspirational to uh, listen in to your talk, Dr. Bennett, and um, you know, listen to your, you and your team's contributions to, to cosmology. So uh, congratulations. Thanks very much. Where are you? Uh, I'm currently in Houston. I'm, I'm at Rice University right now. Uh, one or sort of midterm recess. <laughs> Good, thanks. Let me let me um, ask a question. Uh, uh, some of the academy work uh, last week. Our challenges for international scientific partnerships project published uh, the final of three reports offering recommendations for strengthening international scientific collaboration, uh, even with challenging political times. I'm curious about your work. Chuck and uh, the extent to which uh, it's been benef it's benefited from international scientific collaboration. Right. So, um, so I guess something I, I didn't mention um, uh, directly is that the WMAP was um, was a very inexpensive satellite. The satellites go. <laughs> uh, it was I think one one percent or less of the James Webb <laughs> Space Telescope price. Wow. Uh, yeah. So uh, most. Most space missions, most of them, have international uh, collaboration, uh, largely because uh, you know, single nations can't really afford to, to do expensive things by themselves. And, and you get the benefit of expertise uh, you know, the, uh, from around the world. Uh, because uh, WMAP was so small and we had such a tight budget, um, we, uh, we, we had uh, we had you know, Canadian uh, neighbor uh, uh, participating on the science team, but it, it was uh, essentially completely a domestic funded uh, mission and a uh, domestic team. But I, but I do think that the, you know, it's more, that's more the exception than the rule uh, these days. Uh, it, it'd be hard to name a space mission that is not international. Mm -hmm. Let me let me ask uh, sort of a final question, Chuck. Uh, you you gave some of the unanswered questions uh, in in your at the end of very end of your talk. Um, uh, do you have predictions for the field of cosmology uh, for the future of the field? How do you see the field evolving and changing uh, going forward? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, th things are about to change quite a bit. Um, you know, first, as people know, with, you know, with the, the recent launch of the James Webb Space Telescope, it's going to be starting to take data for science pretty soon. And so we're going to have data from there. And then we have the, the, the Vera C. Rubin uh, Observatory that's going, to be, uh, it, that's going to be surveying the sky initially, and it's going to be outputting a, I don't know how else to describe it, a flood of data. Uh, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, going to, uh, it's going to change everything with that flow of data. And then, uh, then we have the, uh, the Euclid uh, space mission from the European Space Agency with a NASA collaboration, which I'm a part of. Um, and uh, so that's, uh, that's gonna be launching in a, you know, I don't, I don't remember the exact date, but not, not too distant future. And, um, and then we have uh, Nancy Grace Roman telescope from the, uh, that NASA is leading. Uh, that's also going to be launching these uh, and many of these things as other things, you know, too, there's uh, Subaru uh, right focus spectrograph. There's um, the, you know, and there's in the, in the cosmic background field, there's uh, the Simons observatory and uh, just starting uh, CMBS four. There's all kinds of things happening. Mm -hmm. These are largely aimed at the things that I listed. What is the dark matter? What, what is the dark energy? Uh, what about inflation? So, um, uh, I'm just uh, I'm just floored by the amount of data that's been coming <laughs> in in the next day. <laughs> wow! So it's a very exciting time for it cosmology. Is a very time. That's great. Good. Well, I think our time is unfortunately up, but let me again congratulate you, Chuck, and I'd also like to thank Kathy and Mark for joining us today.
Uh, so this concludes our 2103rd stated meeting of the American Academy. Thank you. Goodbye.